Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Secrets of Station X, How Bletchley Park Helped Win the War by Michael Smith. So this is non-fiction. I've actually, I've only about 60 pages in, so this is going to be more like a vlog style review. Sometimes I like to film these because it helps me to stay ahead of my filming. Anyway, we'll start with the blurb and then I have, already have a few tabs that I would like to point out. Uh, I'm also reading this kind of off the back of reading uh, Alan Turing, The Enigma by Andrew Hodges, which was... Kind of the official biography of Alan Turing, it's what the, the movie The Imitation Game was based on. So that was fascinating, and uh, yeah, I decided I wanted to pick this one up, and hopefully soon me and my mum are going to be paying Bletchley Park a visit as well. Anyway, the blurb. The definitive history of Bletchley Park by one of the world's leading experts on Britain's spies. The astonishing story of how the British codebreakers of Bletchley Park cracked the Nazi enigma ciphers, cutting an estimated two years off the Second World War, never ceases to amaze. And no one is better placed to tell that story than Michael Smith, whose number one bestseller Station X was one of the earliest accounts. Using secret files and interviews with the codebreakers themselves, Smith now provides the definitive history of everything that happened at Bletchley Park during the war, from breaking the German, Italian and Japanese codes to creating the world's first electronic computer. For the young men and women who did the bulk of the day-to-day -day code breaking, this was truly the time of their lives. The Secrets of Station X tells their story in full, providing an enthralling account of one of the most remarkable British success stories in history. I read that quite strange, I don't know why. I was doing it a bit like this, with strange inflections. So uh, we talk here about some of the recruits. Um, I'm not going to read all of them, because you probably won't know most of them. But the list ends with, I mean, I don't say that in a condescending way, I didn't know any of them, so I'm guessing you probably don't either. But you probably know this guy at the end, uh, it says... Uh, and J.R.R. Tolkien, Professor of Anglo-Saxon at Oxford University, who, sadly perhaps for code-breaking but not for the world of literature, eventually elected to remain at Oxford and write Lord of the Rings rather than join his fellow academics at Bletchley. So there we go. I thought this bit was quite interesting here. Um, this was basically when the Brits and the Poles started to work together, the Brits, the Poles and the French, they were all super guarded about what they knew. So the Brits thought that the Poles didn't know very much about the Enigma and the Poles just hadn't told them everything. And then they met again, and then they did learn some other stuff. But I think um, during this first period, this was during this bit here, but um, this period was not entirely wasted because the codebreakers discovered one feature of the way in which the ordinary signals operators set up the machine. The operators were using pronounceable sequences of letters for the three-letter message settings on the machine. These were usually the first three letters of a word, or their girlfriend's names, sometimes even the first three letters of obscenities. They became known as Sillies because one of the first that was spotted was C-I-L, an abbreviated form of the German girl's name, Silly. Just occasionally you would get a chap who was rather fond of the same letters, said Susan Wenham, who was 28 and one of the young female codebreakers recruited from Newnham College, Cambridge. It might be for some personal reason. Perhaps one chap might use his girlfriend's initials for the setting of the wheels, or his own initials. Something like that, you know, silly little things. They weren't supposed to do it, but they did. Searching for sillies became something of an art, said Mavis Lever, another of the young female codebreakers, who also worked on four-wheeled enigmas. One was thinking all the time about the psychology of what it was like in the middle of the fighting when you were supposed to be encoding a message for your general, and you had to put three or four letters in these little windows, and in the heat of the battle you would put up your girlfriend's name or dirty four-letter German words. I'm the world's expert on dirty German four-letter words. I thought this was interesting as well in terms of the secrecy that they were operating under. It says uh, it hung by a very slim thread. The British had managed to penetrate the Enigma ciphers only because the Germans had been careless and did not adhere strictly to their signals instructions. If they found out and strengthened, or even changed their cipher systems, all the codebreakers' efforts would be wasted. There were already strict regulations in place preventing staff from talking about their work, but these were now reinforced to the point that most of the people at Bletchley who were not working on Enigma, or a related issue, the vast bulk of the people working there, were not even aware that it had been broken. I also thought this bit was really interesting as well. I guess I'll just, um read it aloud to you. Basically, because during the war they had to be decoding signals constantly and running a 24-7 service, uh, basically, the authorities were so concerned over the propriety of having young women working alongside young men overnight in Hut 6 that they insisted that where women were working night shifts, there must be at least six women, recalled Stuart Milner Barry, the deputy head of Hut 6. The innovation was thought to be not only a strange fad, but dangerous to the morals of a mixed community. Indeed, a total of three girls, which was all that we required, was thought to be insufficient to ensure the observance of the proprietaries and, presumably on the principle that the men would be overworked by such large numbers, a minimum of six was insisted upon. As a result, three girls from another department had to be put on the night shift, not to work, but simply to act as dummies, Milner Barry said. 
Fortunately, this was a precaution that was dropped by tacit consent after a short interval. So, um, first off, I want to read this, uh, this little quote. This is by a guy called Twin, and uh, he was working alongside Turing. And Twin said, he was a genius. He was easily the brightest chap in the place, but he would occasionally come round to my digs and play chess, and I should think that out of five games, he would win three and I would win two. But I knew very little about chess apart from the rules. I knew absolutely nothing about tactics or strategy. It always seemed to me extraordinary that this brilliant chap was absolutely no good at chess at all. It was only because he hadn't given it his attention, of course, but it was a rather curious phenomenon. The other thing about Turing is that everyone says he had a stutter. I spent nine months with him in the same room. What I would say is that when he was asked a question which he thought was interesting, he would get very excited. It wasn't stuttering. He was just having difficulty getting everything he wanted to say out. Turing's eccentricities were legion. He cycled into work wearing a gas mask to stop the pollen sparking off his hay fever, chained his coffee mug to a radiator and buried his life savings as insurance against the collapse of the pound. He had all kinds of crackpot notions based on the fact that he didn't think the currency would stand up to a substantial war, Twin said. He wanted to keep something of value and he put a lot of money into silver bars. Having extracted them from his bank with the utmost difficulty, he went and buried them somewhere. He had a very elaborate set of instructions for how to find them after the war. But he never did find them. What he'd, ne what he'd neglected to think about was that someone might build a new town over the site. And I just want to read this little bit as well. This follows directly on from that. The Naval Intelligence Division was now so desperate to break into Enigma that Rear Admiral John Godfrey, the Director of Naval Intelligence, informed Birch that he was setting up an organisation to arrange pinches, and I think the solution will be found in a combined committee of talent in your department and mine who can think up cunning schemes. The main member of this committee of talent, so far as Godfrey was concerned, was a 32-year-old Ian Fleming, later the creator of James Bond. Like the hero of his spy thrillers, Fleming was a lieutenant commander, although unlike Bond, he was not in MI6. He was in fact serving in the Naval Intelligence Division and was Godfrey's personal assistant, with special responsibility for liaising with MI6 and Bletchley. Fleming devised an elaborate plan to pinch a set of keys from a German ship with the aid of a captured Luftwaffe bomber. I thought this was really funny as well. So this is Mar Mavis Lever, one of Dilly Knox's assistants. Knox was one of the um, important guys. He did a lot of code breaking. Knox was actually one of the few who was able to break codes during the First World War and the Second World War. And uh, anyway, so Mavis said, um, she was. it says she was halfway through a German degree at University College London when the war broke out. I was concentrating on German romantics and then I realised the German romantics would soon be overhead and I thought, well, I really ought to do something better for the war effort. I said I'd train as a nurse and their response was, oh no you don't, you use your German. So I thought, great, this is going to be an interesting job. Matahari, seducing Prussian officers. But I don't think either my legs or my German were good enough because they sent me to GC and CS. This is somebody else's memories here, he says. We were taken by one of the Royal Navy officers to the Café de Paris, an underground, an underground London nightclub on Leicester Square. It was a favourite with Londoners for the very reason that it was underground and relatively safe during a bombing raid. On the evening we were there it was very crowded and noisy, filled with men in uniform dancing to the music of Snake Hips Johnson, a West Indian band leader. The only thing I remember particularly about the, that evening is a tricycle race across the dance floor between the actor David Niven and some of his fellow officers. The following night, a delayed action bomb crashed through the four or five floors of the building over the club and exploded on the dance floor, killing most of the dancers together with snake hips and his band. I thought this is great as well. So this is, uh, says Joe Ekus, a young US Naval Lieutenant, was sent to Bletchley in early 1942 by Op 20G, the US Naval Codebreaking Unit, to find out more about the British codebreakers and what they were doing. My nominal task was to tell Washington what was happening at Bletchley Park, he said. In that role, I got around to see more of Bletchley Park than a lot of the people who were part of it. There was continuing mistrust on both sides. As a liaison officer, I was occasionally asked to get specific stuff, and on one occasion I was asked by Washington for an organisational chart of Bletchley Park, Ekus said. I went to the man in charge and said, could I have a chart of the organisation? He paused and said, I don't believe we have one. I didn't pursue this with him, but I was never quite certain whether he meant we don't have a chart or we don't have an organisation. This is another little interesting thing. Um... Basically, there were loads of super intelligent people at Bletchley Park, so they used to put on really good reviews. They said the acting wasn't very good, but the writing was top-notch. There was a sort of hall just outside Bletchley Park itself, a brick hall with a stage with shows once a year at Christmas. There were a lot of people with talent there who wrote bits, and there were a few actors doing their bit for the war, and a lot of amateurs. It was like a university review, like Footlights. We thought they were splendid. I've no idea if they really were. The performances may not have been so great, but I think the scripts were fairly good, because there were a lot of very bright people there. We would go up to London to see a play or a concert. There were people like Peter Calvo Caressi who would give musical evenings in their billets. I remember Bryn Newton-John, 
an RAF officer in Hut 3 whose daughter Olivia became a well-known pop star, would sing German Lieder. People went cycling around the countryside and there were a lot of love affairs going on. This is quite a cool little um, kind of thing of like how the different classes were working together as well. There were very considerable class differences at Bletchley Park itself. I took up with a girl who I was quite surprised to find was a countess's daughter, because with my middle class Jewish background that wasn't the kind of person you would normally mix with. But it was a place where all sorts met and there were dances and parties and we enjoyed ourselves to a certain extent. But there was always the background and the need to know criteria. That is to say you didn't ask questions about what other people were doing or working on. You never went beyond your own narrow field as it were. This is possibly one of my favourite quotes of the entire book here. Pat Wright was working in Hut 8 and was not one of those invited to Birch's lunch. At the end of her shift she returned her billet. I remember it was the first house I had come across that had a toilet in the garden and I had spent five minutes of my first evening there with my toilet bag touring around looking for the bathroom. But Mrs Tomlin was very good to me. She had an engine driver husband and a fireman's son and she never took the tablecloth off. She always had food on the table. She was a very capable woman with a range of language I had never encountered before. I had been brought up fairly strictly and she used words I hardly knew the meaning of. I was working Christmas Day and so I finished work at 4 o'clock and went back to my billet. Christmas dinner was over by now but she said, Hello Dirk, saved you a bit of Christmas pudding. Here you are, this will make you shit black. I didn't know whether to laugh or what to do. So I said thank you very much and ate it. Nice little thing here again about another one of the strange people. Uh, it was a funny life, very funny, particularly the secrecy and the oddity of some of the people. There was one famous professor of English who used to read about three detective novels a day. He used to walk around the grounds reading them. That strikes me as the thing that Mara from books like Woe would do. I thought this was super clever here, um, so the, the Brits had some double agents. The double agents were repeatedly being asked for information on where the missiles were falling. The mean point of impact of the V weapons was in South East London, four miles short of their target. But by carefully manipulating the times and locations of the blasts reported back by the double agents in conjunction with the times of the launches reported by an RAF Y station sent to the continent to monitor them, the Double Cross Committee persuaded the Germans that they were overshooting and the range of the V weapons was shortened, moving the danger still further out of London. I thought this is also super messed up and something I didn't know. Messages deciphered previously by British and US codebreakers had shown that the Japanese would have surrendered before the bombs were dropped if the Allies had been prepared to assure them that the Emperor could remain on the throne. Given that they received this assurance in the subsequent peace deal, it is impossible to comprehend why the horrors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were inflicted on the Japanese. So they knew they would have surrendered, but they dropped the bombs anyway. So yeah, there we have it. That's what I thought of The Secrets of Station X, How Bletchley Park Helped Win the War by Michael Smith. I gave it a pretty solid 3.75 slash 4 out of 5. Would recommend, especially if you're into this kind of thing. So as always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit subscribe for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.